It's a common tale. The teenager is given a puzzle by his grandfather, proceeds to solve it, which summons its dark, ancient Egyptian magic, and revives its nameless inhabitant. Then he uses thus acquired powers to gain revenge on those who wronged him and become the king of a children's card game. So Yu-Gi-Oh! is your common coming-of-age story. At least, that's how I remember it. For many, Yu-Gi-Oh! was probably their introduction to the anime card game subgenre, if not their introduction to anime itself, probably only outmatched by Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon. But Yu-Gi-Oh! also served as something else. The biggest theme of the first Yu-Gi-Oh! series is ancient Egypt, from the characters to the game itself. Egypt as a sort of magical past is omnipresent through the series. If you know Yu-Gi-Oh!, you know about the Egyptian god cards. But how much Egypt is in Yu-Gi-Oh!, and how much of it is correct? Before I begin in earnest, I should say this. I have no idea how much Kazuki Takahashi, Yu-Gi-Oh!'s creator, knows about ancient Egypt. I am more familiar with the anime, but I've read some of the manga. Some things make me think he has solid knowledge, others suggest he flipped through a book and wrote down things at random. I have limited knowledge about Egypt's history and mythology, so I'll be taking most of my understanding from that and Geraldine Pinch's A Very Short Introduction to Egyptian Myth from Oxford. I should also say all my exposure to the first series, Duel Monsters, comes from the infamous 4Kids dub. And yes, I am aware of how bad it is. But, as that was the Anglosphere's first exposure to Yu-Gi-Oh!, I will largely be going off that, despite its questionable translation. Though I will reference the Japanese version when it is important or offers something the English does not. To begin, let's talk about the series' iconic items. The Millennium Items. The Millennium Items are the MacGuffins of Yu-Gi-Oh!, powerful Egyptian artifacts with vague powers that were created long ago for vague reasons. They are given a concrete backstory later on in the series, but it's your normal weapons of great power backstory about sacrificing souls and dark magic and whatnot. There are no real-world equivalent to the Millennium Items. In style, they're obviously based off Egyptian burial goods, mostly things buried with the deceased to help them in the afterlife. Supported by the Eye insignia on all of them, except the Millennium Key. Though, it resembles the Eye of Horus, an Egyptian symbol, it is called the Eye of Anubis. No. Not that one. God. Never that one. A symbol based off the Wajat, which actually is on the Millennium Puzzle, but was made up by Takahashi. Meant to represent death and dark powers, it shows up everywhere in Yu-Gi-Oh! because of death and dark powers. Most of the items themselves are drawn from Egyptian mythology, be it an Ankh or a Scale, which Egyptians believed they could imbue with special powers, mostly for healing and warding off evil. Not anything to the level of the Millennium Items, but this overview will go over each one and briefly explain what it is properly derived from. The first, and probably least relevant, is the Millennium Key. As devoid of both characterization and life as its user, Shadi, get it cause he's a ghost? It allows its user to enter the minds of other people and control them, I think. It's used probably less than five times through the entire series. It has other vague powers too, like being able to sense other Millennium Items, but they all might be able to do that. The key is obviously based off the Egyptian symbol of life, the Ankh, which it resembles, but besides looking like it, the key has nothing to do with that. The Millennium Scale is the second Millennium Item. It's also about as irrelevant as the key, and is also used by Shadi, proving he got the bottom of the sarcophagi. It's more interesting due to its mythological significance being based off the scale of Maat, the god of justice in Egypt who judged the dead, and shares its ability. If the judge's heart is heavier than a feather from sin, they are destroyed, or sent to the Shadow Realm, whatever you prefer. Except sometimes it doesn't work, because Bandit King Bakor was so evil he broke the scale, which implies a rather large moral dilemma. Next, something slightly more interesting, the Millennium Necklace. Though not irrelevant, the necklace explicitly fails at its purpose. Used by Ishizu Ishtar to see the past and tell the future, the necklace foretells destruction. She then proceeds to use it to cheat at a card game. Until the Millennium Rod changes fate and causes Kaiba to play a different card against Ishizu, thus changing the future. Meaning the necklace becomes useless, since other Millennium items can counteract its power. Though the necklace has no exact historical or mythological equivalent, I assume it's derived from Isis 
the Egyptian goddess of protection, which Ishizu as a character lines up with, trying to save her brother Merrick. Which brings me to... The Millennium Rod is the awkwardly titled fourth Millennium Item. The, uh, Rod is wielded by Merrick Ishtar and his deranged split personality, which is not caused by the Rod, but it's actually just Merrick's suppressed hatred, who uses the Rod for, uh, pretty much anything. Its powers are pretty vague, from mind control to telekinesis to changing fate accidentally. It is the most utilitarian Millennium Item, since it has a built-in knife, which is used by Merrick's father for, uh, all that. Rod is also a slight mistranslation, but not incorrect. In Japanese, the Rod is equally referred to as the Millennium Rod and Scepter, meaning it was inspired by the Scepters of Authority wielded by the Pharaoh, which the translation kind of messes up. The Millennium Ring is more important than it is interesting. The ring is used by the kind and totally not evil Bakura, and Bakura is used by the evil and totally not kind soul and demon in the ring. It's used to detect other Millennium items and destroy people's souls, so the usual stuff. While not conclusive, the ring's ability to turn things evil and destroy stuff suggests it was inspired by the god Set, who was infamous for tearing apart his brother Osiris and hiding his pieces across Egypt, and that whole thing with Horus. Uh, look it up. He also wanted to claim the throne of Egypt, all things kind of in line with the soul of bandit king Bakura who inhabits the ring. And next is the Millennium Eyes Horus to match the ring's set, meaning the eye is more thematically interesting. Except for its user, the devilishly flamboyant Maximilian Pegasus, who had a good idea to base a card game off an ancient Egyptian ritual, the same card game he then proceeds to use the eye's mind reading ability to cheat at. What a guy! The Millennium Eye is probably based off the Lost Eye of Horus, which was torn out by his uncle Set. Oddly enough, Yami Bakura, like Set, steals the eye from Pegasus. Uh, Egyptian mythology has a thing for disembodied eyes. Horus lost his left eye, which became the Eye of Horus, to represent the moon and stars. While Pegasus, owner of Industrial Illusions, lost his left eye to gain the Millennium Eye. When Horus regained his eye, it became the Wajet. While Pegasus got a series of appearances in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX? Finally, we come to the most iconic object in all of Yu-Gi-Oh! The Millennium Puzzle. The item of yu gi -Moto, the puzzle contains the soul of the nameless pharaoh, otherwise known as Yami Yugi, or, 15 year old spoilers, a tem. Its powers mostly focus on allowing Yugi to summon Yami as the show's second main character. It is, after all, only one of the two items to carry a full soul, reflected by its pyramid design which holds the deceased soul of the pharaoh Atem. The puzzle's original divided state, besides when it was the pendant, probably invokes Osiris, who was killed by Set and divided into 40 or so pieces. When all were recovered by his wife Isis, Osiris returned to life, just as, when the puzzle is united, the pharaoh's soul returns to life. The pharaoh himself is connected to the puzzle, which is the only millennium item to bear a full wajet, the symbol of Egypt. But the eye of the puzzle associates it with Ra, since it faces right, not Horus whose eye faces left thus associating it with protection and power through Ra. So, even if by accident, the puzzle's iconography associates Atem with all the major gods of Egypt. There's also the pharaoh's full name, Atem, which is revealed near the end of the first series. At least, that's the one that's written in his cartouche. Egyptian pharaohs actually had around five names. The names history associates with them are just their family names, meaning Atem is the pharaoh's family name. He still has four or so others. There never was a pharaoh at Tem, but I always assumed Yami Yugi was partially based off King Tut, both due to his youth and the fact that the common part of Tutankhamun could sound like a Tem, but King Tut did not die defeating a giant evil demon. Sorry to disappoint. Though, the Egyptian creator god is a Tum, often translated as Atem with an E, who was often worshipped beside Ra. So, like the items, an obvious mythological basis or parallel is not impossible. By the end of the series, the Tem is put to rest in a ceremonial card game between him and Yugi, with the Millennium Items acting as his burial goods, sealing him away into the afterlife with their power. A practice very true to ancient Egyptian custom, when pretty much anything of wealth and power, including people, were buried with the dead. The Millennium Items and the Pharaoh hold degrees of truth to Egyptian history or mythology, either by inspiration or influence. But what about the other gods of Egypt? The Egyptian gods? 
so will not be a serious analysis of them, but I will go over some more interesting details and traits. Being the only three cards to have Divine Attribute and Divine Beast type, the Egyptian God cards are the three most legendary cards of the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise. Why? Because they're gods! No, literally. In the series, the Egyptian God cards are embodiments of the gods, as when Pegasus created them, they were imbued with their power, which explains why each of them has their own unique card color, I guess. Also because they were supposed to be the strongest cards. Strong enough to kill people. Unfortunately, in real life, power creep has rendered them somewhat archaic. The first is Obelisk the Tormentor, who is the most unfortunate victim of this. Wait, maybe it's a translation error? What? A uh, swing and a miss, Takahashi. There's no Egyptian god named Obelisk, which leads us into our first major translation problem. An obelisk was an Egyptian monument, meant to represent life over death and their sun's rays. So is Obelisk an obelisk, or a soldier of one? The Yu-Gi-Oh! wiki theorizes he's supposed to be based after the Egyptian god of earthquakes, Geb. The only real support for this, though, is the edgy alternate card description. Obelisk's design is fine. What's going on there, big guy? He suffers from the problem of all Egyptian gods of having a really spiky design, and his aforementioned mystery crotch in the original artwork, but he got better. Unlike his effect, which is painfully outdated. Having to sacrifice two monsters to destroy all your opponent's monsters, something most modern cards can do with half the effort in half the time. Though Obelisk probably does have the best design quirk of the Egyptian gods, the design on his head is meant to resemble the crown of the pharaohs, which they made more pronounced in later artwork. But he's still not really an Egyptian god, or at least named after one. Slifer the Sky Dragon is... wait, Slifer? Named after Roger Slifer? Who is he? The guy who created Lobo? I should say Slifer is partially named after an Egyptian god, in Japanese, the card is called Celestial Dragon of Osiris, so it's half named after an Egyptian god. Or maybe the dragon is just Osiris's pet? For kids' entertainment, and all their wisdom, changed it to an in-joke. As far as I know, Roger Slifer has nothing to do with the Egyptian god Osiris. Though Slifer has basically nothing to do with Osiris. They're not even the same color. Slifer's effect is probably a reference to Isis gathering the body parts of Osiris. Slifer becomes more powerful and more destructive the more cards are in the hand, being able to automatically destroy opponent's monsters if they're reduced below zero attack. Vaguely alluding to Osiris's role as the god of life and death? Maybe? On the design front, Slifer, or Osiris's, design has always been my favorite. Maybe the Sharp Edge's design policy works best for dragons. Besides the obligatory hieroglyphics in the background, there's nothing particularly Egyptian about Slifer's design. The jewel in its head could represent the Egyptian sun disk, the symbol of light and sun, but Slifer is more associated with light neen than light. The winged dragon of Ra is the Egyptian god associated with light. Hey, Ra! Four kids got one right. An actual Egyptian god. But the winged dragon part is rather confusing. Don't all dragons have wings? But the Japanese transliteration of Winged Divine Dragon of Ra has the same grammatical ambiguity as Obelisk and Slifer. Or you could always go with the alternate THE SON OF GOD DRAGON. Ra is named after the bird-headed Egyptian god Ra, who was in charge of guiding the sun over the world, a trait which Ra's golden color design and avian features invoke, probably the Egyptian god who best embodies its mythological counterpart though it's effectively leaves more to be desired, requiring you to reduce yourself to 100 life points to power it up, 100 meager points you can easily lose. Ra also comes with an upgraded form that is a pain and a half to summon, the winged dragon of Ra, Immortal Phoenix. It's more of the same, slightly stronger and less likely to lose the duel, and this form fully embraces Ra's avian design, being based off the Egyptian myth of the phoenix, which its summoning conditions of revival mirror. Ra's design is efficient, though the old joke is it looks like a chicken. A fair accusation, a result of trying to mix Ra's bird headed design with a dragon. Its golden mechanical design emblazoned with jewels is probably a less pronounced reference to the golden sarcophagi of the pharaohs, which Ra, in this vessel form holding its soul, serves a similar purpose to. There's also a winged dragon of Ra sphere mode, but I'm going to drop that ball. And that's all three Egyptian god cards. 
But before concluding, there's a few others that should be mentioned. Three newer support cards, and uh, I'll get to it. Ra's Disciple is a simple monster made to support the Egyptian gods, blatantly based off ancient Egyptian priests, most likely the ones of Heliopolis. Its design is a nice cross between Ra's and ancient Egypt. Don't have much to say about this one. With Mound of the Bound Creator, my first thought was, why not pyramids? It's field spell made to support the Egyptian gods. It actually is. The mounds are based off the Benben stones. Benben was the first land created in Egyptian mythology by a tum, and the stones named after it were the triangular cap stones found on pyramids. The primeval mound is actually a common mythological concept. That's why pyramids, ziggurats, and Mesoamerican temples all have similar designs. And because a layered pyramid shape is the easiest to build. So props to you, Konami. Good research. Less props to the last card vaguely associated with the Egyptian gods. <sighs> Ma'at, despite having all the Millennium items and its card art, and being named after an Egyptian god, is not an Egyptian god card. It's more like a Chinese bootleg of one. It's a weird card from the GX manga meant to invoke the Egyptian gods, where it was summoned by fusing Winged Karibo and Light and Darkness Dragon. But in-game it needs a tribute of a Light Fairy and a Light Dragon type monster to activate its really arbitrary effect. Honestly, the less said about it, the better. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s obsession with Egypt stretches far and wide across the entire series, beyond even dual monsters. It's one of the first series I remember alluding to darker occult themes, even if it was just the Shadow Realm thanks to 4Kids localization, and despite even that, the heroes were often in real danger, even if it was just being sent to the Shadow Realm over a card game. Yu-Gi-Oh! blurred the lines between magic and reality, one of its best aspects, and it recognized this, though the Egyptian theme became less pronounced. GX and 5Ds were full of magic and spirits and whatnot. Until in 5Ds it turned out all the magic was done by time-traveling robots from the post-apocalyptic future, which was caused by card games and not weird esoteric Dark Earth gods, because one of the show's voice actresses actually turned out to be a member of a real cult, which made the series extremely hesitant about reapproaching those subjects. It just hasn't been the same since. Wait, I feel like I glanced over something.